This is a sequel to a previous story. If you haven't seen it, you can find the link in the description. Enjoy. Amy and I stood at the barn door and watched the rotors of the helicopter stop a couple hundred feet away from us. Then the side door opened, and I saw Teddy's little girls bursting out into the street with open arms screaming, Uncle Ethan! I was surprised that they knew Ethan, and well enough to call him Uncle Ethan. I, on the other hand, was a complete stranger to them, and the guilt of not being closer to Teddy came back to me. Ethan jumped out of the helicopter and turned around, holding out his hand to help the older gentleman out after him. I cursed as I recognized him. Monty Evans, the Columbia executive in charge of negotiating our contract. You know him? asked Amy. Yes. I headed toward them, and soon Teddy joined us as we walked across the lawn. Teddy seemed pleased to see Ethan and puzzled by the obvious anger on my face. Hey guys, Ethan said, grinning widely. Mind if we crash your party? Of course not, Teddy replied, shaking Ethan's outstretched hand and then introduced himself to Monty. I, on the other hand, ignored both outstretched hands, preferring to stare. Come on, Nick, Ethan pleaded. Don't be like that. What are you doing here? I said to Monty. He wrinkled his nose in response. Well, it's probably not the most. Uh, usual way to do it. I'm on vacation, I replied. Turning to Ethan, I continued. I thought that point was pretty clear. Ethan ignored my anger and went back to smiling. Stuff happens, he said. Then he headed toward the house, saying along the way, The newest shit is the video of you guys last night posted all over the internet. Sorry, Nick, Monty said. You too, Mr. Cooper. But this case is taking on epic proportions, and we can't wait any longer, or it's going to get a lot worse. I don't suppose you can get the rest of the band down here, can you? The ones you played with last night? They're in the house, Teddy said, his voice becoming wary. Could you both give me 15 minutes of your time, said Ethan. With the other guys from last night? No, I said. We're having a sit down. It's not. Nick, can't you just mess with me, pleaded Monty. You really don't understand. This shit hit the fan because of the video and the rumors about you, Tara, and Carl. Ethan stopped and turned to me. God damn it, Nick, you don't understand, he said. Monty's bosses know the whole story now. Hell, all of Los Angeles knows the whole story, and within 24 hours, it's going to be in all the papers, on the news, on the damn internet. And his bosses are understandably hesitant to even pursue negotiations with Leadfoot at this point. It's all too explosive for them, and they don't want to spend millions to be left with shit in their hands later if Carl's little stunt has led or could still lead to a major breakup. You know, you could end up on the unemployment line. Your career will go down the drain if we don't get this sorted out before it all goes to shit. I let it all sink in. My first thought was, so what? I was already thinking about quitting. But then Walter's ditty about making sure I had something to do came to mind, and I decided I didn't want to limit my options that much. Monty interrupted my musings. Yes, things looked pretty bad last night. But that all changed when those videos hit the internet this morning. Teddy smiled. How so? Ethan's smile was enigmatic. Let's wait until the whole group is assembled, okay? So we walked the last hundred feet in silence. I walked Ethan and Monty to the barn, and Teddy went to gather Will, bassist Rob, and drummer Jimbo. I watched them enter the huge room. Will was tall and burly, with unkept brown hair, a tense, brooding demeanor, and classic pianist's hands, meaning his fingers were damn long. Rob was hiding behind Will's back, but as he stepped around him, he presented blonde hair, clear blue eyes, and a wrestler's build, muscular arms and broad shoulders going to narrow hips and legs. Jimbo was remarkably good-looking. About 5'10", not thin or fat, as farm boys in Grant City are usually built. Short brown hair styled to the side, and an open face unable to hide emotion. All three of them fidgeted as Teddy brought them up to speed. Surprisingly, Teddy seemed amused. I had a feeling I knew where this was going, and I'm sure Teddy did too. I expected him to be impatient or aloof, but he only smiled quietly, giving nothing away. Boys, Monty began, looking at the three college students. I'm sure you're all well aware that your little show last night has aroused, shall we say, interest? 
Their smirking looks at each other told me that they were well aware of their YouTube success. That's all well and good, Monty continued. But my boss got a call this morning, and he now shares that interest. Go ahead, Ethan prodded. Tell them who called. Monty looked at all three of them, then his gaze settled on Teddy. Bob Dylan, if you can believe it. Said he'd never heard her better. The singing, the arrangement, all of it. Teddy nodded, as if this was just business as usual for him. I, on the other hand, made no effort to hide my surprise and appreciated the high-five between Will and Jimbo, who were clearly tickled. I don't care if you like Dylan's music or not. In the industry, he is an unquestioned genius. When Bob Dylan speaks, which is rare, record company executives listen, especially since he reinvented himself about a decade ago and once again proved his ability to create. Teddy, I don't mean to say we liked everything we saw and heard, Monty continued. I spent half the morning going through the other videos from the show. To tell you the truth, they weren't the best quality. Still, we'd like to see what you have, if you don't mind. Teddy only nodded. Now? Monty nodded in response. If you don't mind. Teddy looked at the boys, then at me. All of us? I realized what that meant and so did everyone else. My gaze stopped on Ethan and didn't take my eyes off him. After a moment, he nodded. All of you, he said. Teddy looked at me and shrugged, his smile starting to fade. I guess I'm game, he said. He looked unsure now. Me too, I said. Teddy let out a long sigh. Okay, he said. You guys turn everything back on and I'll go get everyone back here. Wait a minute, Monty said. We'd rather just see you without interruption, if you don't mind. Teddy just ignored him, and Ethan and Monty turned to me for help. Don't look at me, boys, I said. If this is what you really want, you'd better get used to it. And we did. We played four more numbers, two rousing tunes, one ballad, and one medium tempo. Monty recorded everything on a handheld video camera to show to the customers in Los Angeles. Sure, the sound would still suck, but it would still be better than a cell phone video posted on YouTube. When we were done, Monty thanked us and declined our invitation to stay for food. Instead, he promised to call sometime the next day, hopped back into the helicopter, and flew off. Ethan, on the other hand, stayed for the feast. I was amazed, and my guilt at being gone so long was compounded when I noticed that almost everyone knew Ethan by sight. It was already an hour after the show started and I was helping Teddy pull pork shoulders out of the smokehouse. Are you really interested in this? I asked. He smiled. We'll talk away from prying eyes. We left the shoulders to rest under a massive aluminum foil tent. Meanwhile, I made my rounds, chatting a bit with Mom, Dr. Bob, and Will, all of whom were familiar with each other. Mom planted a bombshell in me when she informed me that she'd helped Teddy recruit Will, Rob, and Jimbo from Chadwick College. It's simple she said. Just ask the music professors who's worth anything, then set them up with Teddy. He'll take it from there. Half an hour later, Teddy called me into the kitchen to help him slice pork shoulders for sandwiches. He handed me two plastic things he called bear claws and showed me how to use them. Then we each sliced one shoulder and set to work shredding 50 pounds of fatty pork into a pure barbecue treat. Before he spoke, Teddy let me get settled in. Okay, he said. The answer is yes, I've given it serious thought. I remained silent, not knowing what to say. After a few minutes, I noticed Teddy wasn't shredding anymore and looked up. He was looking at me. Say something. Okay, I replied. Do you have any idea what you're getting yourself into? What you're getting your family into? He smiled his lazy smile. I know exactly what I'm getting myself into, he said. We've been preparing for this day for a very long time. By now I paused, waiting for clarification. The clarification came when Ethan burst through the kitchen door. He looked us both over and said, You're not going to tell him now, are you? Yes, Teddy replied. Might as well get it over with. Tell him what? I asked, feeling dread gripping my limbs. Ethan ignored the question and rummaged through the drawer until he found another pair of bear claws. Then he joined us and started digging through the pork. I realized that not only did he know everyone, but Ethan Rose, the Jewish kid from Jersey, 
knew how to cut up the pork. Not that I ever knew he didn't care about the kosher table, and even knew where the kitchen utensils were kept. Now I realized it was a setup and went back to work, waiting for an explanation. Finally, Ethan broke the silence. Truth be told, he said, lead foot hasn't been anything special since the second album. You're a great songwriter, but all your best stuff was done when you teamed up with Teddy. I nodded. He was right, of course. We'd been riding the wave of our initial popularity ever since, though it was still good enough to sell millions of albums and fill hundreds of arenas. So, five years ago, Ethan continued, maybe ten months after the Grammys, when you guys had them down, I flew over to Teddy's. Even then, I noticed a slight decline in my songwriting, and I wanted Teddy's opinion. So he showed me everything he was still writing. I looked up. I had no idea Teddy was still writing. We definitely hadn't played any of it the night before. It sucks, Teddy said. Good enough to fill an album, Ethan continued, but not a hit. You've always been a better songwriter, Nick, Teddy continued. Ethan has spent the last five years trying to talk me into being with you again. So why not just call, I asked. We could have cooperated. You could have stayed out of everything else. I was going to, Teddy said. About a year and a half ago, I contacted Ethan and told him to reach out to you. But that was in the middle of studio sessions for Cactus Rose, Ethan said, naming our latest album. All the songs were already written, and you were burnt out from the studio sessions. The timing wasn't right, and we were already running out of record contracts. So why didn't you just wait a while and then tell me, said I. Neither of them met my gaze and I waited for an answer. After a minute, I lowered my bear claws and put my hands on the counter, resting them against it. Fess up, guys, I said. There was more than a hint of growing anger in my words. Teddy looked up first. About five months ago, you gave Ethan the next batch of songs. You had just come from an American tour and spent almost the entire time writing them. He handed them to me for comment and I went through them. Reworked most of them, actually. This was a pleasant surprise and I had no idea what the big deal was. Okay, good, so they're better than I thought. However, my smile soon disappeared. Ethan, the songs we negotiated are mine. Teddy never approached them. Oh, shit, Ethan said. Nick, I got the songs back about two months ago, just before we started negotiating. They're better. Much better, in fact. Not quite yet, but close. Then why aren't we using them? Because Ethan found out about Carl and Tara about a week before he got my designs, Teddy said. I felt the anger boiling up inside me, my jaw tensed and my hands turned into balls of fury that I struggled to keep on the counter in front of me. You knew about this for two months and you didn't tell me shit, I said to Ethan. And you, I turned to Teddy. You just told me a few hours ago to find out the reason before making a decision? Did you know too? They looked at each other, then back at me. My advice remains unchanged, Teddy said. Neither of us has any idea how long it lasted, how many times they got together, or most importantly, why it happened in the first place. But Jesus, Teddy, you should have told me. Now he dropped the bear claws. When, Nick? Oh? You want to answer me on that? When the hell am I going to tell you? You haven't told me shit in six years. Think about it. Six damn years. You didn't even know I was married, did you? My anger at him was now joined by shame. He was right, of course. I sent you a goddamn wedding invitation, Nick. You blew it. You didn't even send a card. And you want to tell me when I should have told you? Better yet, why the hell did I even bother? Theodore Cooper shouted Jenny from the doorway. We all looked at her, and the expression on her face was enough to strike fear into the hearts of greater souls than ours. You have guests outside, she hissed. I don't think they need to listen to this. This, this nonsense. Do you? We all hung our heads, muttered apologies, and went back to shredding pork. She turned, slammed the door behind her, and soon we heard her cheerful voice telling everyone that they were just boys. I didn't see the invitation, Teddy, I said. I'm sorry about that. To tell you the truth, I felt like shit since I first saw you. You were really good, and I had no right to expect that. And what I said still stands, he said. You still need to learn more. Hell, 
if they've only had fun a few times, and if you can live with the reason, I'm not saying I'd forgive her and try to keep the relationship going. But I'm not you, and I think you really need to follow through. I nodded. Then I looked at Ethan. But you do, I said without raising my voice. It's just about the money, isn't it? You were afraid to tell me because you were afraid it would ruin the group and your cash cow would die, right? No, Nick, he said. It's not just about the money. You're like a brother to me. You're the only one I've ever gotten along with. Well, you and Teddy. I just didn't want to see you in the desert. You left Leadfoot without a backup plan and... Well, I'm not sure. I just know I didn't want you to disappear, okay? And he told you, Teddy said. No, he didn't, I replied. I walked in on them, Teddy. You walked in on them because I finished negotiating three hours earlier that day, Ethan said. You knew they'd be together? He nodded. I asked someone to keep an eye on Carl. When he pulled up in your driveway, I got the message as soon as we started. Remember how angry I got at the beginning and ran out, cutting the session short? Why didn't you just tell me? Would you have believed me? Me and not Tara? Or even Carl, for that matter? I hummed. Well, Carl, for sure. He's just weak. But he was right, and I knew it. I'd be mad at him for even suggesting that Tara was cheating on me. Then why did you try to bring me back to negotiate? He didn't think you'd run away, Teddy said. He thought you'd go straight to him and either demand Carl be kicked out. Which I immediately suggested, Carl interjected. Or just quit Leadfoot, Teddy finished. In the meantime, I was going to show you Teddy's rewritten lyrics, get you a record deal, and save your career, Ethan added. Oh, and help you find a new bass player. And you helped him with that, I asked Teddy. His lack of denial told me yes. It was just too sudden. Truth be told, I was pretty pissed. But why be angry at either of them? I highly doubted I would have played it any other way. Sure, Ethan was looking out for his wallet, but he was really looking out for me. And for Leadfoot, too, for which we were paying him a lot of money. Then it occurred to me. Okay, if this was all about keeping Leadfoot together, and Teddy went back to working on songs, then what was this day all about? No one at Columbia has ever seen anything like this, Ethan said. Those scenes on YouTube? They're just dynamite. Sure, you're in them, and that guarantees a lot of interest. But these scenes are so much more than that. Hell, they're like that British chick from that show. Susan Boyle, right? Anyway, it's even bigger than that. Word of mouth spread like wildfire across the net. Monty checked before we landed here, and three of the seven videos already had over 20 million views, and the other four had over 15 million. And I guess you're not just ignoring Bob Dylan, are you? Said Teddy, returning his lazy smile. Not if you want to keep your job at Columbia, no, Ethan confirmed. So they wanted to see if there was a way to cash in on this. Right after Dylan's call, Monty called me and asked if I thought it might work. You two would be back together again. I immediately went to him and showed him the rewritten lyrics. He looked them over and just dropped the whole folder of songs on the floor. Ethan smiled. If I had shown him those songs from the beginning, we would have gotten the contract by now and now we'd be in a situation where Carl is dropping out of the band in the middle of work. At that, my anger faded away and I had a hard time holding back a smirk. So now he's really screwed, isn't he? Worse than you think, Ethan said, relieved that I wasn't angry anymore. He's almost broke. Really? said Teddy. Ethan nodded. He's spending shit faster than he's making money. And unlike you two, he doesn't have song royalties. He gets some income from album sales, but they can't fund his champagne and caviar lifestyle. Nick, you have, by the way, along with Tara, a very nice place in Brentwood. But you've seen Carl's place, right? His damn ski lodge in Aspen, his condo in the Big Apple, his mansion in Malibu. Hell, I think he just got an apartment in London. What the hell is he going to do in London? I asked, laughing. Chase London chicks, Teddy suggested, which elicited familiar laughter from everyone there. We finished slicing the pork and placed it on trays. I held back as Ethan carried the first tray out the kitchen door. Teddy? I said, and he paused. I'm really sorry, man. 
He turned around. I may have seemed a little more abrupt to you than I intended, he said. I shook my head. No, you were right. I was nothing. And I can't believe I never saw the wedding invitation. He smiled lazily. I may have gone a little overboard, he said. I purposely sent it to your house in the middle of your world tour, knowing you'd never get it in time. Sorry, old buddy, but I just wanted a normal wedding. Having Leadfoot members present wouldn't have been normal at all. Asshole, I said. Back off, he said back. We carried our trays out onto the deck and placed them next to the buns on the serving tables. Turning back to the crowd, I noticed Amy watching me with a thoughtful expression on her face. Teddy walked over to her, kissed her forehead and whispered something. She turned to me again and her face relaxed. I smiled and she smiled back. And then I was pierced with the urge to be the one to kiss her forehead and whisper soothing explanations in her ear. I grabbed my beer and retreated to the corner, alone with my thoughts. I realized now that Tara had cheated on me more than just once, and it seemed to have been going on for some time. I had little doubt that I would never get over it, and I was certain that my marriage had officially faded into oblivion. Nevertheless, I decided to take Teddy's advice and at least listen to her. After five years together, I really wanted to know the whole truth about what she'd done, or at least as much as she was willing to tell. I felt a hand on my shoulder and turned around. Penny for your thoughts, Amy said softly. Just remembering what my father used to say, I said. Some days you're a dove and some days you're a statue. She laughed and her face lit up with laughter. I had never heard her laugh before, and I had never seen such an expression of pure joy on her face. I suddenly felt giddy at giving her that look, that uninhibited laughter. So who are you? she asked. A dove or a statue? I shrugged and smiled broadly. I don't know yet, I said. But things are looking up. I had no idea what the next day had in store for me. Chapter 14 You better get up, Walter muttered in my ear. I turned, surprised to see him so early. The bedside clock showed that it was a little after nine, and I'd gotten enough sleep already. What's the problem? I asked. He looked outside, then back at me. The little tramp didn't bother to wait, he said. She's on the morning shows spouting off what she thinks, saying she's leaving you because you're a womanizer. I smiled. This was definitely a weird dream. I thought he'd just said, I said, get the hell out of bed, he rumbled. The blankets flew off me as if torn by an invisible hand. I froze. He'd never done anything like this before, and I didn't even know he had the ability to move things. Yeah, he said, just like a real ghost. Now get your ass off the bed and get ready. The press will be gathering there any minute. He was right, and I got myself cleaned up as quickly as possible. Fifteen minutes later, I was in the kitchen looking at a fussing Dr. Bob and a furious Carol. Have you heard yet? demanded Carol. I nodded, and she didn't bother to ask how I knew. Is it true? she barked. I shook my head. Not once, I said. I told you, Bob said, patting me on the shoulder. Our home phone rang. Carol picked up the receiver, said hello, and handed it to me. It's Ethan, she said. Good morning, I said into the receiver. Not yet, he replied, and his voice sounded more awake than I'd realized. But it's going to be a really good morning soon. What's going on, I asked. Looks like they've been rushed, he said. Tara's agent and publicist have decided you're not coming back and seem to have gone on the offensive to protect her image and make her look like a spurned spouse. I nodded. Jesus Christ, why did she do that without talking to me? I would have kept my mouth shut. Shit like this was the last thing we both needed. How do you think you're going to play it? I said. I'll tell you when you get there, he replied. Where to? To Teddy's house, he said. Wait until the first members of the media show up, then get in your car and head here. Why wait, said I. For them to follow you here. No sense in subjecting your mother to that kind of shit on a Sunday morning. But what about Teddy's family? There's no... We're fine, Teddy said on the other line. Half an hour later, I pulled into Teddy's driveway, 
a trail of news vans trailing behind me. They must have learned their lesson from the previous day because they all parked on the side of the road and none of them drove onto Teddy's property. So what happened? I asked, finding myself in Teddy's living room. This, Teddy replied. He turned on his TV and a talk show came on the screen. I watched it. Tara, the interviewer said, a fake sincerity in her voice. There's a rumor going around that you're having problems in your marriage. Is that true? Tara tried to smile but couldn't. I realized it was a great attempt. I'd seen her do it a million times before. Getting no response, the interviewer smelled blood in the water and pulled out her knives. I'm sorry if this is unpleasant for you, but there's talk in Hollywood that you've started dating Carl Simpson, your husband's fellow Leadfoot bandmate. Is that true? Tara started softly, and the camera zoomed in on her feigned pain. Carl and I are friends, she said. I admit we've been seen together, but he's here solely as a friend to help me through this extremely painful time in my life. The interviewer could hardly contain his glee. And what painful thing is going on in your life right now? Tara looked directly at the interviewer and shifted her gaze to one of fierce determination. Nick is having a series of affairs, she said. Carl was the only one who shared that information with me. I didn't believe him at first, but my agent, who is also one of my oldest and dearest friends, insisted that I try to verify the stories of Nick's infidelity. We confirmed that Carl was telling the truth. How many women has Nick dated? The interviewer asked, not believing her luck. I'd rather not discuss that, Tara said. Suffice it to say, I told him about my discoveries last Wednesday and he left and I haven't seen him since. Teddy turned off the TV and turned to me. He tried to keep a lazy smile on his face, but he only succeeded in looking upset about the whole thing. Ethan, on the other hand, was smiling. Well, he said, it looks like events have overtaken us. I nodded. It looked like Tara and I weren't going to have that little conversation. She'd forced her hand on me, and now I decided to play the cards I'd been dealt. The cards she'd dealt me, actually from the bottom of the deck, and cut her out of my life. Now the choice is yours, Ethan continued. We can either let her get away with it, or we can bury her. My eyebrows raised, and I looked at him, waiting for him to continue. I've been documenting her little attempt since I found out about it, Ethan said. We have pictures, video, and affidavits. After our conversation yesterday, I also contacted L.A. and asked several people to do the digging. I've already heard back from them this morning, and we may be hearing a lot more soon. My jaw dropped. More, more, said I. Yes, Ethan replied. It looks like she slept with several of her co-workers. Half the cast and most of the crew know about it, and some are willing to share the sordid details. I went cold. This was standard Hollywood nonsense but I had never suspected that my marriage or my loving wife was the norm. However, the past few days had shown me that I was just another part of America's sweetheart's perfect facade. She was a bright, simmering, charming, and loving wife. No. So what's it going to be? asked Ethan. I looked at Teddy. He was looking right at me, his jaw clenching and unclenching nervously. Bury the bitch! Jenny yelled from the kitchen. I giggled. You? I turned to Teddy. He nodded. Talking isn't going to get you anywhere good, partner. I think you have all the answers now to figure out where your marriage stands. So let's talk about options, I told Ethan. If we do nothing? Do nothing, and then your career will suffer. Any negotiations for new records for Mustang Ranch will become problematic at best. Come on, I said. Shit like this happens all the time. It never hurt Mick Jagger, did it? Ethan laughed. No, he agreed. But then again, Mick Jagger's whole image is always the bad guy. Yours, on the other hand, was always the quiet, thoughtful poet. A good boy, in other words. If left unchecked, you risk ruining the image. From Columbia's point of view, they're risking untold millions on sudden obscurity. Remember, Nick, you have a huge following in both the country and rock markets. The rock fans won't care. But old Marge from Faxville, Mississippi, who goes to church every Sunday and drags her husband with her, she'll have a problem with you. I looked out the window at the multitude of vans lined up along the road, then turned to Ethan again. 
Okay, I said. Tell me how to play. He grinned from ear to ear and opened his briefcase. Twenty minutes later, Teddy had the press assembled in the barn. They were ready when I walked in and made my way over to them. Nick! They shouted in unison, and then a barrage of questions sprinkled in my direction in an audible cacophony. When they finally quieted down, I began. Same rules as yesterday, guys, I said. We'll start with the ladies and then move from left-handed to men. I looked at the young cutie who had started the day before. Excuse me, but you were first yesterday, I said, and then turned to the elegantly dressed professional woman who had been second the day before. Mr. Harlan, she began. Her tone was condescending and her eyes blazed with anger. She was either infuriated by my tricks of the day before or furious that I could so blatantly deceive poor Tara Boyd. Ethan suspected she'd be the perfect first choice, and her tone suggested to me that everything would go according to plan. Miss Lockhart, I replied, trying to keep an innocent look of pain on my face. Mr. Harlan, your wife told Valerie Plymouth this morning that you've ruined your marriage with a long string of affairs. Is there any truth to her assertions? I took a deep breath, turned to make eye contact with the assembled reporters, and then turned back to the minx who thought she'd caught my drift. It is with great regret that I must state that Tara was right at least in part, I began. At those words, a dozen light bulbs flashed and blinded me for a while. It helped me keep the grimace of pain on my face as I continued. Tara was right that our marriage was definitely over. But she was wrong in claiming that I was ever unfaithful to her or our marriage. With that, I withdrew the contents from the manila envelope I held in my hand. Then I turned to the young cutie from entertainment tonight. Your turn, Miss Miller, I said. So you claim you've never cheated on your wife? Not once, I said. If she has evidence to the contrary, as she claimed this morning, I'd like to see it because I'm going to tell you all right now. Until Wednesday afternoon, when I saw my wife and one of my oldest friends in the world doing it in our house, I thought I had the perfect marriage. Now, however, I know that's not the case. Are you saying she was the one cheating? The first man in line asked as lights began to explode in front of my face and cameras and microphones moved closer. Unfortunately, I said, that's exactly what I'm saying. Do you have proof of that? the cougar demanded, her disbelief obvious. Your turn, I said to the next man, ignoring her. He looked at the cougar and smiled. Do you have evidence to back up your claims? He asked. This report was prepared by A&R Investigations out of Malibu, California, I said, holding the papers out in front of me. As you will all soon see, my wife was not entirely truthful this morning, and this report confirms it. What was she not truthful about? The next reporter asked. She was having an intense physical relationship with Carl Simpson for at least the last two months, I said, and my voice shook at the end. It took me a moment to pull myself together, and I nearly shit my pants with internal glee, playing the role of the scorned husband to the fullest. This report has dates, times, pictures, and more, I continued after a moment. Furthermore, I've been informed that apparently this was not the first such incident in our marriage. Do you know the identities of the others? Someone shouted. I really don't want to go into details, I said, slipping the report back into the envelope. My manager will be giving you all a redacted version of this report shortly. Until then, I just want you all to understand. I loved my wife with all my heart and I thought she loved me in return. I was faithful to my marriage and to Tara from the day we met, and would never do anything to jeopardize our marriage. I never cheated on her and would go to my grave without doing so. But unfortunately, it was a terrible shock to me to find out that Tara didn't feel or act the same way. The questions sprinkled in again. I ignored them, raising my hands in a gesture of silence. Ladies and gentlemen, I said, I know you all want to ask many more questions. However, I ask that you respect my desire, my need, to deal with all of this in private with the few family and friends who have offered me their support since I learned of all of this a few days ago. With those words, I turned and walked out of the barn, leaving Ethan to deal with everything else. How did it go? asked Teddy. I was exhausted. It had been fun for a while, but now that it was over, it finally hit me. My marriage was ruined. 
My wife had betrayed me repeatedly, and I had suspected nothing. And now the whole damned world would be watching for a long time to come. Jenny hugged me, tears streaming down her face. You really deserved better, Nick, she repeated. All I could do was hug her back and try to hold back the tears. I succeeded, but barely. Chapter 15 By noon, all the reporters had dispersed, and the guys in the group pulled up to the house. Any word? asked Jimbo for everyone. He'll be here in about an hour, Ethan replied. That was the first I'd heard of it. Noticing my look, Teddy uttered. Nothing's decided yet, he said. We'll see what they have to say and then we'll talk amongst ourselves, okay? I shrugged. It wouldn't hurt to listen, but it surprised me that Teddy seemed to be actually considering it. Forty-five minutes later, Monty pulled up to the driveway in a Lexus SUV. When we were all seated in the living room, Monty began. Columbia wants to sign you to a recording contract, he said. Rob and Jimbo exchanged greetings and Will shook his fist in excitement. Terms? asked Teddy. Monty outlined them. Right off the bat, they weren't great, but they did include incentives if album sales matched or exceeded expectations. All in all, it was almost as good as they were offering for Leadfoot, which was surprising given Leadfoot's longevity and popularity. Still, they understood that my involvement in the deal was critical, and Monty made that clear from the start. So Leadfoot is dead? I asked. He nodded. Tara's little antics this morning guaranteed it he said. Your reaction, while good for you, is killing the group. They have no interest in re-signing Leadfoot at a time when the band is in turmoil. What if we get rid of Carl? asked Ethan. Monty shook his head. It doesn't matter. Then we'll have to deal with the unknown, the new band member and whether he'll fit in well, at the start of a new contract. Then of course there's the songwriting. Monty turned to Teddy. It's not just Nick they're insisting on, Monthly said. On the songs, too. And you. They think there's great chemistry between all of you. He looked around at all the band members, making sure they understood. We need all five of you or nothing. Honestly, guys, they thought they could only succeed with Teddy and Nick, but I've convinced them otherwise. You guys give a very unusual sound that we don't hear very often and would like to explore further. However, it's a risk that record companies don't often take. That's why they have these terms. They don't think they can lose on this one involving Teddy and Nick, but I'm convinced the payoff will be whatever all five of you do. Monty waited patiently for us to make sense of it all. I have some conditions, Teddy said. Then, looking at the others, he added, If you guys want to do it. I saw Will, Rob, and Jimbo nod enthusiastically. Teddy then fixed his gaze into my eyes, waiting for a reaction. I'm interested, I said. I guess I don't have anything else to do, do I? Teddy was satisfied with that, and he continued. I have a family, he said. They'll come first. Always. I smiled. I liked where this was going. Monty, however, looked unsure. So I'm going to give it two years and two albums, Teddy continued. I'm going to take a sabbatical for teaching. But if after two years I'm not happy with it, if it's hurting my family, then I want to give up on the third album. Does anyone have a problem with that? asked Ethan. We all shook our heads except Monty. It might change some of the terms, he said. Conditions don't change, said Teddy. All that changes is that we can drop the third album if I want to leave and if they or you don't want to do it without me. And what do we get in return? said Monty. Teddy smiled, and I realized he'd already planned it out in advance. If we stay together, you get an automatic option on the fourth album on the same terms as the third, he said. And I won't have the right to opt out of the fourth album. Monty thought for a moment, then uttered. I think I can sell that, he said. When can you give me an answer about the rest of it? Give us a couple hours, Monty, Ethan said. Go get some lunch and get back here at, say, three. See if you can confirm that the terms suit you, and we'll let you know in a couple hours. Jenny entered the room just as Monty was coming out of it. Well, she said. They're offering us a very favorable deal, Teddy told her. She nodded, bit her lip, and turned to me. Will you take care of him for me? she asked. 
I shifted my gaze from her to Teddy, then to Ethan, Rob, Will, and Jimbo. They were holding their breath, waiting to see if I was in or out. Then I saw Amy standing in the kitchen doorway, with her son on her hip and an expression on her face I couldn't read. So? asked Ethan. Here I was, hours after finding out my marriage had broken up. And to top it all off, I found out that the band that had been the meaning of my life for the past ten years was gone. And did I mention that I had two hours to decide if it was worth starting all over again with an old friend I hadn't seen in years and three virtual strangers? Without saying a word, I walked out the door to get some fresh air. Ten minutes later, my musings were interrupted by a quiet presence behind me. I think Teddy really wants to try it, Amy said. It's been all he's talked about for the last few years. He regretted leaving the band. That's why he gave all those songs to Ethan. He wanted to come back. I turned to face her. It's just all too sudden, you know? She nodded, sympathy coloring her face. I mean, damn, I just wanted some time to think, to take it all in, I said. That's gone now. She put a hand on my shoulder. I don't think so, she said. Teddy and Jenny are taking care of you. They'll be there for you. The band, well, it'll give you something to do to keep your mind off things, right? She was right, of course. In fact, I couldn't think of a better group of people to be stuck with during the sudden storm of shit that seemed to be growing in intensity. How about you, I said. She looked surprised. What about me? If I do this, go back on the road and back to the studio and keep doing this. How will you feel about it? She didn't flinch. She'd anticipated it, even if I was just now thinking about it. How I feel about it doesn't matter. She took my hand in hers and pulled me across the grass toward the trees at the back of the lot. Nick, she said, there's no yes right now. There's you and there's me, but there's no us, you know? I didn't say anything back, and she seemed content to explain everything for my silence. Yeah, I like you, she said. From what I've seen, I do. But we're not the same people we used to be, and we didn't even really know each other. I'm just a vision from your past. Someone you think you'd be comfortable with, given everything that's happened to you. She stopped and turned to me. All of this is happening to you right now, Nick. You can see that, right? Great, she was right. I had stuck my head up my ass and was now enjoying long-forgotten visions. But maybe I want to get to know you better, I said. That's fine she whispered. Then that's what we'll do, okay? We'll get to know each other better. But I'm not going to run into your bed, Nick. Now, now. Not now, when your marriage is just about to crumble. I don't need that, and my son certainly doesn't need me to go through something like that again in the near future. I listened, looking into her eyes. Of course I heard her. And deep down, I knew she was absolutely right. Still, I leaned over and kissed her. Her lips were soft, her breath minty, her eyes first opened in horror, then closed as she began to kiss me back. Then, as I gently pulled her to me, she pulled away. Damn it, Nick, she said, her face reddening with anger and embarrassment, and her eyes glistening. Weren't you listening to what I just said? Thank you, I whispered back. At least you gave me some good dreams for a change. And there's something to look forward to in the future. Her anger dissipated and she pulled me to her, hugging me tightly. I hugged her back, enjoying the feel of her body against mine. Enjoy it, she whispered. That's all you're going to get from me for a while. I enjoyed it, and again she was right. That was the limit of our contact for some time to come. Back at the house, everyone gathered in the living room. As Amy and I entered the kitchen, I heard some soft conversations, but they stopped and all eyes turned to me as we entered the front room. Amy sat down on a chair, leaving a seat for me next to her. I sat down and looked at her, then at everyone else. Okay, I said, I've made some decisions and I have my demands. At that, Rob and Jimbo exchanged greetings again, and Will threatened his fist again. I smiled at their enthusiasm and hoped they were ready for what they had gotten themselves into. What are your demands? said Teddy. I'm not running this group, I said. Of course not, Nick, said Teddy. This is a partnership. We'll all make decisions together. I shook my head. That's not how it works, Teddy, I said. 
You guys make the decisions and coordinate them with me. But that's it. I don't want to make any more decisions. I turned to Ethan. This has been a lead foot problem for too long. I felt like the entire weight of the world was on my shoulders and mine alone. Like I was babysitting a bunch of two-year-olds. Now it's time for someone to babysit me, okay? Ethan looked at Teddy, who turned to me and pronounced, But you want to have the right to veto everything? I nodded. It's not that I'm undemocratic. You guys just make decisions and then come to me to make sure I agree with them, you know? It gives me a chance to hear what you're thinking and where we're going and a chance to change something if it's a bad idea. And I'm just talking about basic decisions, Teddy. I don't care what we have for dinner, where we stay, or within reason who we hire. Ethan already knows all this shit anyway. I looked at all four of them and leaned forward. There are no majority rules here, guys. Trust me, if three of us start turning on the other two, we're not going to get anywhere. So everyone has to agree on all the major decisions anyway. But I don't want to make any more decisions or even participate in this process, okay? Consider it just keeping me in the loop after you've made the decision yourself. Teddy looked at the other guys, and they all either shrugged or nodded. Guys, I said, I'm in no condition to make decisions like that right now. My head is too far up my ass from everything else. So if you want me, here are my terms. Other than that, we're standard and equal partners in everything else. Songwriting is separate, of course, but you'll all have your own chances at that if you want it. That's fine with me, Will said. Rob looked at Jimbo, got his agreement, and then said, Us too. I looked at Teddy. Well, partner, you wanted it, and now you got it. Are you okay with that? Teddy looked at Jenny, who nodded her head thoughtfully. I guess so, he said, keeping his eyes on Jenny. When Monty returned, he had prepared the basic agreements for Ethan to submit to our attorneys for review. Columbia had agreed to Teddy's terms, however, and they didn't need to know about my terms. That was just between Ethan and my bandmates. Anyway, in the last five days, I had left one of the biggest rock concerts and one of the most famous and beautiful wives in the world. Now, with no time to catch my breath, I was embarking on a brand new band with a whole new cast of characters. And all the while, only two thoughts swirled in my head. Why had Tara betrayed me so horribly and apparently for so long, and would I ever be able to start a relationship with someone new again? Someone like Amy. Chapter 16 I got the answer to the first question around noon the next day. Teddy and I sat up until late Sunday night working on two songs, two songs of mine that he'd reworked and that now needed a final polish. Around 11 on Monday, Will, Rob, and Jimbo joined Teddy and me in the barn and began working on the arrangement of the first song, When I Get Back. Will was a pleasant surprise in the arrangement department. He repeatedly offered fresh takes on tempos and arrangements, taking a slow ballad and turning it into a rockabilly tune with dual vocals and a shimmering background backed by a pulsing guitar sound, driving bass, robust drums, and a complimentary piano line. I never imagined the song would be performed this way. On the other hand, Leadfoot never had a piano, except for a studio musician brought in for one song, and the new arrangement was a much better fit with this new lineup. The first person to see it was Teddy. I was standing with my back to the barn door, watching Jimbo on the drums and strumming a rhythm on the acoustic guitar, when Teddy's lead ended with a squeal. I turned to him with a laugh as my eyes followed his, and the joy left my heart. Hey, Nick, Tara said. She looked just awful. I knew from Ethan last night before he left, and from Jenny this morning, that the press was going wild. It seemed the private investigator's report had been confirmed, and now additional affairs were leaking out almost hourly. What do you want? I said, my voice sounding harsh. Guys, Teddy interjected, why don't we go up to the house for a while? Rob and Jimbo, walking by, glanced at Tara. If you play your cards right, you'll get her, I thought. When we were alone, I sat down on one of the stools and waited for her. I made no attempt to hide my anger or contempt for her, and she hesitated to move away from the entrance to the barn. Then she whispered something, and I couldn't make out what it was. What? said I. I asked if you could call the dogs off now, she said, and tears streamed down her face. This was for real, I thought, remembering her inability to cry when asked. Just tell them to stop. 
You've already made your point. I didn't pick this fight, I said, raising my voice. And now you, the one who told everyone I was a traveling spouse, have the damn nerve to stand here and ask me to do something you didn't have the decency to do for me? It wasn't my idea. It was Janice's, she pleaded, confirming my thought that her manager was behind all of this. She said you'd ruin me if I didn't take the initiative. Bullshit, I growled. She said you could turn goose shit into goose liver pate, and that's what happened, right? Tara didn't deny it. You were leaving me, she said. You were having fun with me, I objected. Anger flashed through her tears. Oh, for crying out loud, grow up, she hissed. You knew that. I was flabbergasted. How the hell can you think that? Haven't you ever read the tabloids? She said. Christ, they printed almost every rumor about it. But you refuted them all, I objected. I stopped asking, figuring it was just the usual nonsense. She didn't answer anything, wiping the tears from her face and lowering her eyes. Jesus, Tara, with Carl? You had to know I didn't understand a damn thing, right? She nodded. So what made you think I knew about the others? You knew I'd be pissed. That's why you kept it a secret. So you also knew I'd get angry about the others, right? She nodded again, no longer trying to play out the Nick kept me angry scenario. So how many were there? I asked. Does it matter? She asked, afraid of being forced to answer. You know about most of them now. Or at least Ethan knows. So it's all true then? She nodded. And it's not even all of them? It's just most of them? From the look in her eyes, she realized she'd said too much. Can't we get past this, Nick? If I stop, can we get past this? I laughed, and her pouty look turned into resentment at being rejected. Let me ask you something, Tara. Let's say you find out that every time someone comes to your house, they steal something. Not just once, but dozens of times. If you find that out, would you invite them back? They're not our guests, Nick, she shouted. This is our goddamn marriage. That's exactly right. You stole something far more important than silverware, Tara. You stole my damn self-respect. You gutted what I thought was perfect. Now I wonder if we ever had a marriage. I wonder if you loved me at all, or if you only wanted me as a new publicity stunt. That brought on a new batch of tears. You were never a publicity stunt, she cried. I loved you from the first time we met. More than I've ever loved anyone, Nick. You have to believe that. That's because you're wrong, I replied. You've always loved yourself more than you've loved me. Her look told me I'd hit the mark. So what you told me earlier, she said, on the phone? It's true, isn't it? Yes, Tara, I said, realizing what she was talking about. I've been faithful to you since day one. She nodded, wiping the tears from her face again and snorting. You're right, she finally said. I'm not good enough for you. She laughed. Hell, I wouldn't stay married to me. She reached over and touched my face with her fingertips. Please, Nick, for old time's sake, can you get Ethan to call the dogs off? And the divorce will go through a prenup? I asked. No more drawn-out legal nonsense? No more attacks on me in the press? She smiled and nodded. Cross my heart. And my stuff from home? I asked. In my car, she replied, nodding her head toward the driveway. I nodded, thinking about it. What the hell, I thought. This way we'll get this over with quickly and hassle-free. I won't have to go back to L.A. and I'll be done with her with a few strokes of the pen. Best of all, as I realized, the events of the last day had already tarnished her image, and Carl was now just a voice from my past, and nothing more. So yes, had I been condescending to her? Perhaps a little. But an immediate cessation of hostilities and the opportunity to move on with my life seemed like a small price to pay. All right, I said. The divorce is formalized immediately. Irreconcilable differences. I'll see the proposed settlement papers by next Monday, and everything will go smoothly. Do you think you can do it? She hugged me back. I promise, she said. 
You do this and I'll call off the dogs. She broke the hug. You think you can call them off now? The sooner I have the papers, the sooner I can get Ethan off your ass, I said. She wasn't happy, but her look told me she felt better than I expected. Thank you, Nick, she whispered. She leaned over and kissed my cheek. And Nick? I looked at her one last time as my wife. Yes, Tara? I'm really sorry, she said, and tears came to her eyes again. About everything. I didn't mean to hurt you, and I still love you. I'm sorry too, I said, deciding to cancel the dog and just start over if she broke her word. In this case, though, she was true to her word. The next morning, the settlement agreements were delivered by personal courier. Chapter 17 So much for the true story of those crazy five days. The rest of the story you all know by now. Carl went bankrupt about 18 months ago. They made him sell all his fancy houses and he lives in a little house in Malibu. He plays on studio sessions and you can still see him occasionally on the arm of one star or another. Vince, our drummer from Leadfoot, has completely abandoned music. He'd made some great investments and wasn't going to work a day for the rest of his life while he kept his eye on everything. He's now somewhere in Scotland painting landscapes and playing golf. We chat every couple of months, and he's expressed an interest in working with us on an upcoming album. Will has some great ideas for double percussion, like the old Allman Brothers band used to do. John Bauma, the guitar virtuoso from Leadfoot, is now our producer. He's still just as solid, and he works well with Teddy and Will, arranging what Sales has shown to be great tunes. He produces other bands, both in Nashville and Los Angeles. Like Vince, he was road-weary, and it all went to his head. Tara, of course, was released from her show when ratings plummeted after her divorce. Of course, the divorce went through quickly, and of course, I immediately called the dogs off. But the damage had already been done, and the press took it upon themselves to keep digging up dirt. She appears in occasional roles, but her credibility has been seriously damaged, and it will be a long time before she's America's sweetheart again. The funny thing is, Rob has finally reached out to her. He told me about it before I even read about it somewhere, all embarrassed and afraid I'd get mad. But I just laughed, especially when he told me that they spent the whole evening in bed and she was asking about me and talking about me. Even as they were thrashing around the bed in a fit of passion, she called my name now and then. Rob admitted that he would have lost his boner if she wasn't so damn beautiful and energetic. Poor Tara. Mustang Ranch, a brothel somewhere in Nevada, tried to rape us over the use of their copyrighted name, and we decided we wouldn't tolerate that, even if they were professionals at it. Will brought his basset hound to training all the time, and they named him General Beauregard. We all agreed that would be a great name for the band. I don't care what they say behind the Mason Dixon. We're not named after a Confederate general, although maybe the dog was. Five months later, General Beauregard's first album was released to universally rave reviews. That album, Another Happy Face, with the real General Beauregard on the cover, eventually sold 8 million copies and produced two number one singles on the rock charts and three top 10 singles on the country charts. Our next album, Saturday Night Drive-In, released to coincide with the start of our first major tour, surpassed the first and became a diamond, selling 11 million copies in just over a year. The concert tour sold out before we even played our first show, and the reviews were as good, if not better, than the album. Teddy seems to be handling everything pretty well. He takes Jenny and the girls with him on tours, and they ride in their own bus. Sometimes I join them so we can work on songs, but it's so rare to get anything done because of the noise all these kids make. Kids? Well, you've got the little Teddy girls in Brighton and Walter. Walter, who you all know from the huge picture on the cover of People magazine, was born 10 months ago to Nick and Amy Harlan, a hometown boy and his beautiful high school sweetheart. That's how they printed it anyway, but now you know it was just a bunch of crap that Ethan and the guys in the publicity department came up with. The real story was a little more drawn out. It actually took almost eight months after that weekend before Amy agreed to go out on a date, and several more months before she finally accepted the proposal I'd made on that first date and all the ones that followed. She accepted, proving to me that everything you hear about quiet and reserved girls is true, and she spent almost every spare minute since then trying to drive me to an early grave. I'm not quite there yet, though, and I hope she keeps coming up with new tricks to throw me off balance. We live in a house not far from Teddy, Jenny, and the girls. 
We managed to maintain a semblance of normalcy in Grant City, where everyone has known both of us for most of our lives and doesn't really care if we make much money. And Walter? Well, I'll leave that for another day and another story. Suffice it to say that he has forgiven me and sends his regards to you. The End If you enjoyed this video, don't hesitate to like, share, and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss others like it.